Welcome to the Philippines, a country named after Spain's King Philip II after being claimed by Ferdinand Magellan in 1521 and then a little later on occupied by the Japanese and then the Americans and then they finally gained their independence again in 1947, which is an exceptionally brief way of saying that there is a lot of freaking history here. And we are super excited to dive into the history and the food and the people because we've been here for a few weeks now, but we've been kind of focused on settling into boat life. So we have not started exploring yet, but we are going to do that starting today. And we are doing that here in Subic Bay, which is where we checked in. And it's a pretty wild place because there are super yachts and shipping ships and military ships and then a yacht club and then this gym of a place. So this is Vasco's and it is like the most seafaring vibe of a marina I have ever been to. And we're talking like old school Indiana Jones style. And it is not kitsch. This place is legit. So this is a family run business and they've got a restaurant, they've got a little hotel, but the real magic is back here. So the father's Brian Homan. He's an Australian shipwreck explorer that moved here in 1977, opened the very first dive shop the next year, and then discovered the very first ever shipwreck in the Philippines. And because of the like unique discoveries that he was making, he started working with the National Museum and then had even more discoveries and he started collecting porcelain and gold and silver and World War II relics and so many things over the years. And the ones that the government allowed him to keep, he's put into this museum here. And it's free for anybody to come and explore just because he's so passionate and he just wants people to experience it. Oh, uh, yeah. And you, where did you say you found this one? In Portugalera. Portugalera. And this one, you think estimated time frame or no? 1620. 1620. And then these, what are, where are these from? Same wreck, 1620. I got a nice ring on that wreck. So that's, that's Brian. This is his place. We ran into him uh, poking around. He starts telling us stories. He's just so passionate, which just makes you so excited. But he was saying that these jars with the dragons on them were from the first wreck that he ever discovered. And he said there were jars of all sizes and every single one of them had these dragons on them. And it was very unique, something they had never seen before. Of course, he was showing us those coins and the necklace, and now he's going to get the key to the safe so he can show us some other neat things that he's found and are not sitting around out here. So, very, very exciting. Never been clean as how it came out of the water. Wow, tiny little fingers, look at that. 1520, Nostra Senora de la Vida. Senora de la Vida. Vida. So you actually know whose it was? Yeah, the name, I know the name of the wreck. Oh, the name of the wreck, okay. I thought you meant maybe the person that no, no, belonged the, to you. No, no, the ship was called the Nostra Senora de la Vida. What a find. Was it in a drawer? Is that how you found it? No, no, there's no drawers left. There's nothing. Yeah. Just, <laughs> look, and, and that, there'd be so much stuff on that wreck because we didn't have the right equipment to search for it. We were just in a little vacuum system and just vacuuming it. Oh, shit, look at this. <laughs> and it's because when you're wearing a wetsuit, you stick it up your wetsuit. I didn't start with scuba, I started with a hooker, with a hose to the compressors. And you're supposed to be on the bottom for 60 feet for 60 minutes. And I was down there for hours. And every afternoon, all my joints would be sore. And I thought when I was going to get older, I was going to be, but I'm fine. And I guess even with those shipwrecks, when you went inside, was it not a problem? Didn't you? Well, the wrecks I did, the early wrecks I did wasn't, there was nothing left of the wrecks, all the hulls were gone, they were all wooden hulls. So know? were you just like sifting through sand. silt? Sand. Did you have to, is this like an armed guard that was like on We're the... We're in a bad area, we couldn't finish that project. It was Mindanao, it was very dangerous, and we had the gunship, that ship had four 50 caliber machine guns and two cannons on it. We'd go and stay with the mayor every night, and he had 30 heavily armed marines around his house while we were there. Now after three weeks, the government just said, we're getting out of here. It's just too dangerous. Mindanao. And so did you end up discovering anything when you were on that trip? Yeah, I got a lot of stuff. I got a lot of plates and that, but we only there, we only did three days on that wreck, the big wreck, all Ming Dynasty. And we had to leave it all complete. I don't even know what happened to it. Wow. Oh, that's look at that gun. Oh my goodness. That's me, yeah. Oh! Nice. 
I did it, like kept it. I did. So look at it all. Yeah, it's incredible. And you actually touched all of that. That's what blows it, my mind. All, all over here, all over there in the museum, it's everywhere. It's in the restaurant. Everywhere. Yeah. The history in this yeah. building is nuts. Today I came to Subic for the US left. Oh wow. You sailed that boat into Subic Bay? Yeah. How neat is that? Right? Wow. I come from Spain, 22 months, so I, I got it off of this thing. Man, you see the scuba gear and you think. God, the time they were doing it, he was a pioneer. He was doing it like with Sylvia Earle during the same time as Jacques Cousteau. And like those guys were really on the forefront and we learned about them in our scuba courses and how dangerous it was for them back then. The gear was not what it is today. And you realize like, man, they were really risking it all to find this treasure. And it gets me like little goosebumps walking through the museum because I think, Let's go find some treasure. Let's go get some booty. Let's go get some gold and some silver and like some galleons. And oh man, just like that childhood excitement of walking through yeah. the museum is, is really cool. Yeah. All right, you can see why I said Indiana Jones sort of vibes, right? Because I mean, just the coolest thing I've seen in a long time as far as somebody exploring and just doing incredible things. Very inspiring. I want to now go do something, I don't know, super exciting to go discover and find something. Uh, and they're adding on to the dock space, so they're creating more space and that doesn't normally look quite this chaotic. Yeah, oh, okay. Right now this, this is the kind of thing that kind of gets you. <laughs> He's like, well, I've got a list of, of still 200 undiscovered wrecks in the area. I could give you the list. And I'm like, oh, I don't know that I should take that. That would be almost too tempting because I'd have to revamp the whole boat. We'd have to turn it into a like, dive boat and then I'd be here for, uh, yeah. It's clearly, it is addicting. He did it for so long. It's just makes you think, makes you think, maybe. Gone with the Winds 2.0, treasure hunters. I know a guy. So this is the first marina we brought Curiosity to, and it feels very serendipitous because it's just it's a whole new start to a whole new chapter and like what a place to begin, right? And it's all very alluring, <laughs> which means makes me kind of want to like dive right in and get started. But unfortunately we do need to focus because we need to sit down for about the next six to eight hours at least and do some very serious editing because we have a very full day with friends tomorrow which means i have to work the rest of today we have to work the rest of today mostly jason but i have stuff to do too <laughs> which means we need to focus and i am reaching for today's sponsor and our longtime go-to ag1 which is most of the time our morning routine but every once in a while i know that i'm going to have a long day and i kind of save it for the afternoon or sometimes i'll just take a second dose because it gives me that boost because it is well so many things all in one right versus having like a full counter of like pills and powders and everything else this is my multivitamin my minerals my prebiotic probiotic it's cognitive support it is yeah, immune it support yeah it's got adaptogens which helps our bodies manage stress so it is so many things all in one which means it's boat sized i can sock up on this and carry six months supply without it taking up too much freaking room and we do have to stock up because we're not always somewhere where we can receive shipment. So when we are, I load up. It is super easy. So it is just one scoop and eight to 10 ounces of water. I like to keep my bottle in the fridge. So it's always nice and cold and ready for me when I'm ready for it. Give it a nice shake about, get it all mixed up and then drink and enjoy. And it has a sort of pineapple and vanilla flavor to it although there is no artificial flavors or sweeteners supplements are a little bit like the wild west there's just not a lot of regulation but with ag1 they are nsf certified and what that means is a third party comes in and verifies that what they say is in there what you read on the ingredient label is actually in the powder so i know that i'm getting 
what I'm paying for. Plus they have a medical advisory board with people like Dr. Andrew Huberman and Dr. Peter Atia, which loved his book, by the way, completely changed the way we've been thinking about working out and longevity in general. And so I feel like I've listened to their podcasts. I've read those books. They're people that I feel like I've grown to trust. So it gives me an extra confidence in this product in, in a kind of a, a realm of things that can come with a lot of bold claims. So I feel good about taking AG1. And if you want to give it a try for yourself, then just click the link down in the description box below or scan the QR code that you see on the screen. And AG1 will give you a year's supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five travel packs for free with your first purchase. So I'm gonna drink this. We're gonna get to work and we're not gonna film that because it will literally be us parked in front of computers for like six to eight hours straight. It'll be a very little movement, but we will see you again very soon. We are in for quite a treat today, my friends, because we have already made a local friend. Her name is Jay. She's sitting here right next to me. Yes. And she is, well, so many things, which we will talk about on the way, but I guess fellow sailor. She is a private super yacht chef. She is a uh, logistic. She is so many things. So we are very excited, but we're going to the market today. Yes. So we can get, well, some local Filipino food, but kind of a little bit of culture. Anyway, she's gonna share lots with us today. I like the challenge, that's number one. Okay, we are here. Follow Jay. <laughs> Olongo Falls City Old Public Market or the Lumang Palenque. So there are like three markets, but this is the one that my mom would always do her market stuff and I would go with her all the time. So the people that we're meeting now, they're the ones that, they probably know me for like quite some time now. <laughs> Your whole life? Well, yeah. This is Ati Nene. And then this is where we get our fruits amazing fruits. You know that Zambales is known for its mangoes. One of the best mangoes in the world. I have to claim that. In the world, yes. No no mangoes can compare to mangoes coming from Zambales or in the Philippines. So That's a would... bold claim. Okay. <laughs> Quote me on that. <laughs> and all of the Filipinos will say the same thing. Especially if they're from Zambales. These are like the sweetest ones, right? Yeah. yeah. These Super are the ones sweet. that I served on the Philippines. Okay, that's what so, I thought. Yeah, these were really good. So, uh, yeah. So I find it interesting that you have, I've seen tofu all over the market. So you make it, I guess it's very common, everybody makes tofu, huh? Yeah. So you eat a lot of meat, but you eat tofu. Yes, because they go together. So there's this dish here in the Philippines. It's called tokwat baboy. So it's tofu and pork. They're both fried and then you put them together and then it's drenched in this soy um, sweet dip sauce with um, onions and stuff. So it's like a, it's like a, a co very common um, appetizer when we're drinking. So it's really, really good with beer too. Okay. So <laughs> the thing is that the, the tofu that we find in the market, it's extra firm so it's a lot firmer compared to the silk tofu or yeah. the Korean tofu ones. What are these? This is called Chico. So oh, Chico. Yeah it's a <laughs> my mom loves it. <laughs> Me maybe not so much but this is like um they're sweet they're brown inside. Can we open one? Oh it's juicy in it's there. It's juicy. I wouldn't have and it has that. a little bit of seeds in it. Interesting, right? Yeah, I it's, like it. It's kind of sweet. It has a grainy texture, sort of like a sugary sand. Mm -hmm. But the the flavor is very different. It's kind of caramelly. It's nutty. It's sweet. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you do like it. <laughs> my mom. It's not your favorite. It's not my favorite. My favorite is the mangoes and the watermelon. <laughs> Taking notes of all the money we spent just to keep track of everything. It's a little crazy when you're in a market like this to try and keep track of receipts and cash and change and 
It's too much. These are like the tiniest little onions I have ever seen. But they're all like that. It's just a different variety. They're like little shallots almost. But they taste like normal onions. <laughs> So what part is that? Belly. That's belly. It's called the one we're diving. Alright, so this is the wet market and we're here for some fish and I don't know whatever else. But they have a huge variety of stuff and it comes in fresh every single day. But the key is if you don't get here early enough, chances are you're not gonna get whatever you planned on getting. It's an angel painted. Like beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. What is this called again? Tinapa. 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 Okay, and it's it's smoked. It's smoked fish. Okay. Very flavorful. Just like saute it a little bit in the pan just to heat it up. You serve it with garlic fried rice. I pair it with some chopped tomatoes and red egg. Good. Red egg? Red egg. Are those salted or? Salted eggs. Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, sorry. Yeah, salted yeah. eggs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, so these bright, colorful fuchsia eggs are salted. I, I don't know that I've had a salted egg. Yeah, in China. Oh, maybe I did. That's right. That's right, yeah. So, anyway, yeah, so I'm down. Let's, let's go for it. And then there's also um, dried um, squid. Uh, Oh yeah, these little taxi motorcycle thingies are crazy. Okay, and what are we getting here again? We're getting palabok. And what is oh, it? Um, palabok is a vermicelli noodles with a sauce of seafood and pork rendered fat. Uh, it's really, really good. And he's been here for as long as I could remember. But at the end of the market routine with my mom, we would come here and buy palabok and breakfast because that's what we would have for breakfast when we get home. So if you find yourself here at the market, it's just outside. And if you find this guy, that means you know you're a local if you're here. So if you see it, local delicacy. Have there it's the the banana leaf. Yeah, banana. It's, it's, what you see here is like a yeah. Okay. There's a sticky rice wrapped in bamboo or a banana wrapped in dough and sugar. <laughs> the choices. Get them both. No. <laughs> okay, I'll get one to Okay. That sounds like a plan. Thank you. How much? Ten pesos. Ten pesos. Oh, it's so hot. <laughs> mm -hmm. Plantain, sugar, pastry dough. What's not to love? It's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Practically like you're at the state fair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> go on, go on, go on. We had a full crew. There are five of them. Jay is a, an entrepreneur big time because she has a couple of different businesses that she is running, like a cleaning business. She does like logistics, as I said. She is also like private hire chef. So she has a lot going on. So she's buying stuff for tonight as well, which is sort of why she's got additional help here today. She also has an Instagram, all sorts of stuff. Oh, ready? Yeah. <laughs> So is this your favorite local spot or is this just a good spot because yes. of the view? <laughs> no, this is one of my favorites. Whenever I would have guests that would travel from Manila or from abroad, this is one of the places that I would take them to first. Top of my list. Really? Yeah. Okay, so would you call it like, is this like the best restaurant in Subic or is it just the fact that it's just a good place to go? 
It is one of the best restaurants. Okay. That much I have to give it credit. The food is amazing. I need to have like a black and tuna fix and I haven't <laughs> had it for quite some time because you know busy back and forth Manila but yeah. Alright so let's talk sailing because you are a sailor but new-ish so tell new us how you got started in sailing because you've lived here your whole life right? Yeah well how I started sailing it didn't happen actually here in Olongapo it happened when we were in Puerto Galera so good friend of mine Sean he's the sailor and then he's the one involved in the sailing community here it was like a very long holiday okay. and he said hey we're down here in Puerto Galera why don't you just come here for a change of scenery and so I went and then I was like I want to do that and they were like you have to be training for a year before you can get on our boat I was like okay then I will train for a year <laughs> and then I came back here and I enrolled <laughs> I enrolled in the civic sailing school here, which is down at the lighthouse. And I did. I didn't tell anyone that I enrolled. And then the word got out that I did. A few months later, they needed a crew, and then I went on their first race. And the rest is history. So we went to Malaysia, and then that was it. <laughs> There's just really a, a pretty tight-knit community of sailors here in general, and they do a lot of races and rallies and all this stuff I'm now learning since I'm, we're here. So whatever you say, you know, they were like, oh, you have to be in training for a year. It's because they were all like racers and race boats, and so they're like, you don't get to just jump on and get, a, get that position right away. Like, you need experience to get into that. I think they tried to give me a hard time, but they needed a crew anyway. So they, <laughs> they were like, do you want to come to Malaysia? And then I just said yes. And so they, you did the passage to Malaysia? Or you no, just flew we flew. There. We okay. flew and then joined the, the Raja Muda race. I think this was in 2019. It's not a common sport here in the Philippines. And there is this like notion about if you're like in sailing, you are rich because of the main sport itself. Absolutely, but yeah. I was like, I just happen to have like friends who own boats. <laughs> it doesn't sound, it's, it sounds funny, but, but I think it's a sport that people can, can explore. Um, like even on, a, on, a, on an optimist or like a dinghy, yeah. it's fun, it's yeah. really fun. So now you feel like you're hooked? The sailing as a sport and race, um, it's always going to be there, but I've also come to accept that, you know, chartering and doing like the cooking on a boat is also something that I would like to explore mainly because I'm very passionate about cooking so and you like sailing and I like so sailing. you know you're good on a boat yeah. it's a good combo yeah. yeah so I think it's a win-win yeah chef on a boat that's probably the best <laughs> job a hard job I would say but I think it it's, is. it's probably one of the, the best gigs I, also because we like food so I think we're right there with you yeah, <laughs> yeah. Looks good. Yeah. Looks very good. Look at that. Perfectly done. <laughs> when was the last time you were here? It was like, like, almost like a meringue. You don't need to know any more than the chocolate. The last well, I'm gonna last bite. I'm not gonna leave it. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> So now where are we and what are we doing? This is my home, this is where I was born and raised. Lots of cooking happened here and this is where I learned how to cook. I am gonna give you like a cash course in Filipino cooking. It smells so good. Which we do with no, we're just getting started. Yeah, I like yeah. learning how to cook adobo and of course crowd's favorite, lumpia. Lumpia, okay. Am I saying that right? Yes. I'm trying to get down the lingo, it's gonna be a little bit. We just got here. <laughs> lumpia? and adobo. adobo adobo but not adobo is what we think of as a mexican it's like adobo sauce this is very different yeah. so i'm excited hi and welcome to the very first episode of she tried and tasted so for today because we want to start with a big fan we're starting this with a special guest Pandesal. <laughs> Pandesal. I like the local coco jam. That looks like caramel. <laughs> 